Matthew chapter 9, and I want to begin reading this morning with verse 18. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to him, If I only may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the little girl arose, and the report of this went out into all the land. May God's rich blessing be to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, for it is your word that gives light and illumination to our lives and to our pathway. And Father, we need more than ever to hear a word from the Lord. Speak to us today. Feed us from your word. And may your people be satisfied. And may they be encouraged today to know if there's still a God in heaven that is still dispensing his word to his people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> We're going to be continuing our mini-series this morning from this overarching theme of as the Father sent me, so send I you. And that passage is in John's Gospel, John chapter 20, uh, verses 19 and through about 21. And I believe that's an illuminating passage of Scripture, that after his earthly ministry, after being betrayed, after being crucified, buried and raised from the dead, Jesus appears to his disciples and one of his parting words to them was, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And I believe as we investigate that phrase, that passage, in the light of the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, it would give us a greater understanding as to how we as Christians in the 21st century should be discharging the ministry that the Lord has entrusted to us. The Bible is not a cookbook with a bunch of recipes. The Bible really is a guidebook that has principles. The Bible is not a road map. It's not a uh, a navigation system. The Bible is more like a compass. It points you in the right direction. And as you go in that direction, then the Holy Spirit will then order your footsteps, lead you and guide you and open doors for you. But all that happens in the, the process of what we call life and decisions that we have to make and situations that we find ourselves in. So when Jesus says to the disciples, as the Father sent me, so send I you. It's important that we investigate and understand how did the Father send him. And we said in previous weeks, the Father sent him literally, physically, Jesus. He got up off of his throne in glory. He laid aside his royal diadem. As the old Negro preacher used to say, he wrapped himself up in human flesh Walked down through 42 generations. He put his feet on the earth. He literally came into the world physically. So the Father is sending us literally and physically into world systems. The Father sent him to a specific place, a specific geography. Some people always are concerned about where they're. I, it has never concerned me since I was a Christian as to where I was. Because wherever I am, that's where God has chosen for me to be at that point in time. So I'm never worried about getting to the next place. I'm more concerned about am I doing what God wants me to do at the place where I currently am. And that's something young people need to understand. 
the future belongs to those that see it, but the future depends on what we do in the present. So rather than being preoccupied with the future, we need to prepare ourselves for a future if we are a part of it. But it's also important that we engage in the present, that we engage in the way that God would have us to engage in the present, because the future is not guaranteed to any of us. All we have as a guarantee is the present opportunity that we have. And so as the Father sent me, Jesus said, so send I you. He sent him literally, physically. He sent him to a specific place. He sent him to a specific group of people, the Jewish people that existed in Israel at that time. And he surrounded him specifically with a group of people, the disciples. And then he narrowed that down and he gave him 12 that he would have an intimate relationship with for a three and a half year period that he would give his life to pour his life into that group of people, and that they basically would be the basis for his ministry. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, so send I you. Now, I've been discharged in ministry in this city for over a quarter of a century, half of my adult life nearly. And from this pulpit for the, for the last 17 years, and have preached to hundreds of people, probably thousands over that period of time. But when it comes right down to it, what I have to show for 17 years of ministry are you. Because y'all are the only group that stayed with me during that period of time. And some of us, some of you have been here the entire time I've been at Grace Bible Church for the last 17 years. And even prior to that, when I interim at Grace Bible Church back in 1987, I believe that it was. And so what I've come to understand that in this thing that you call ministry, that God sends you to a place, God will surround you with a group of people that will have a vision to do something for the Lord. So I've gotten to the point where I'm never concerned about who's not there. My real concern is, are we ministering to the people that are, are there? Are they being encouraged? Are they being strengthened in their faith? And are they being effective in living their lives to the glory of God? We're in some tough times difficult times, and I'm not a prophet of doom, but I am a realist, and I believe part of leadership's role is to define reality, not to have people to live in a place that doesn't exist. We live in a real world with pressure and responsibility and with challenges. This nation came to the very brink of a shutdown of the entire federal government, which would have wreaked havoc across this nation, even potentially even around the rest of the world. And there are some times that are coming, and it doesn't matter which part of the political spectrum which you're on, the fact is, the reality is, change is in the air. And the $38.5 billion that's going to be cut out of this budget will have ramifications, and the billions that will be cut out of the 2012 budget will have further ramifications. And I'm not choosing sides. I'm a realist. I understand. As a father, as a husband, and as a pastor, I understand. When your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. So that's where we are nationally. We spend more than what we take in, and we've been doing that for years. And so we're financing the government by borrowing money from China, and that's a, that's a problem that you just cannot continue to exist. Now, the reality of the situation is, is that the actual implementation means that there are going to be budget cuts that we will feel in our neighborhood, in our community. That's just the reality. And so we can argue about it, fuss about it, complain about it. That's the reality. But what that creates is an opportunity for the church to respond, to respond with relevant ministry, not another welfare social service program, but to respond in such a way to help people that in every situation there is opportunity. There's opportunity for people that are willing to work hard, that are disciplined, people that are willing to put forth effort. They can distinguish themselves from other folk through their work ethic and through their commitment to excellence. I speak a lot about education because I believe that education is indeed the social justice, civil rights issue of the 21st century and beyond. So where we are in this nation and in the world, here's where we are. There are going to be two types of people in the United States of America. There are going to be people with literacy and numeracy skills, people that can read with comprehension, people that can compute, and people have the basic educational skills to be lifelong learners in a changing economy. Those people will be able to make the adjustments necessary, learn the new things they need to learn to keep themselves competitive 
in the marketplace and therefore will have access to employment opportunities as the society moves more and more to a very sophisticated, highly technological information age. Then there will be people that don't have literacy and numeracy skills and they're in trouble. They're in trouble because the huge manufacturing base in this country has seriously declined over the years and it's not coming back the way it used to be. America was the envy of the world after World War I because the European in infrastructure was decimated because much of the war was spent on European soil. Germany and uh, England and even as far as Asia, Japan, they had no base for an economy. So wasn't the, the, the World War II wasn't fought on these soils, so our manufacturing base, it was in place. And it was the envy of the world because it had been blossomed under and during the time of the war. So we made the goods and we shipped the goods to the rest of the world. That's no longer the case. And now there are other places that have a manufacturing base that is equal to ours. They have a much lower labor cost. They can produce goods cheaper than what we can manufacture them here, and then we import them here. That's where we are. And so that's why it's so important to keep lifting up education and challenging young people and their parents to realize we are in the competition of our lives. And it's the people with the literacy and the numeracy skills who are the lifelong learners who will be able to distinguish themselves from the rest of the group. And some of those people should be coming from the church. It used to be a time when the church produced the intellectuals. The church produced the scholars. As a matter of fact, many of the Ivy League schools, those schools came into existence to train preachers because people recognized that the preachers should be intellectuals and they should be able to weigh in on the difficult issues of the day and bring a biblical perspective of what thus saith the Lord. And so we're back there again. We're back there again in a time where the church needs to produce people that distinguish themselves from the rest of society as leaders. And as we do that, we demonstrate that the power of God and that the kingdom of God is being processed in and through the local New Testament church. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. The Father sent Jesus into the world. He sent him into the world to a specific geographic location, to a specific group of people, surrounding him with a specific group of disciples, and they were to then to seek and to save that which was lost, to bring more people into this new sphere, this new kingdom of God that became known as the church. When you understand that passage and you use that passage to interpret the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, you would see that Jesus was on a relentless mission to penetrate every single sphere of Jewish society. He left no stones unturned because he understood that people don't just live in a religious system. People live in a social system. They live in an economic system. They live in a recreation. They live in a cultural system. People live in complex systems, and those systems influence the way people think and the way they behave. So if you're going to change a society, you can only do it by penetrating the system that has the influence over people and influence those systems in a way that is honoring to God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what he did. And so when he, before he departs to go back to be to his father, he is one disciples. He has disciples strategically located, strategically placed in every single sphere of society, in powerful political places, in powerful economic places, in the commercial places, in the agricultural places, in the domestic places, in the religious system. He has disciples sprinkled everywhere so that they can influence their syst that system with the message of the kingdom of God. Are y'all following me? That's what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian means more than just getting dressed up on Sunday morning and coming to church. That's important. And we ought to get dressed up on Sunday morning and we should come to church. Because we need the corporate experience. We need the corporate worship experience. We need the energy and we need the spiritual ambiance that's created by corporate worship. Because I believe that God does reserve a certain manifestation of his glory and his power when people come together in humility and in faith to submit themselves to the mighty hand of God, to allow God to minister to them, to fill them, to rejuvenate them, to replenish them. So we need that coming together. 
So we need that coming together to be reminded who it is that we are, but the Christian life is to be lived out in the marketplace. As we then go back in the spheres of influence where God has placed us, bringing the presence of God in those places, and that's what Jesus did. It's really simple, but it's profound. And the problem with the church today is the church views itself as the church only when it comes together. And we can only influence the people that come to the church building per se. But our role is to try to influence the greater society and to try to offer salvation through faith in Christ to as many people as we possibly can. And God will open the hearts of many and they will come to faith in Christ. And then we can then connect them back to the local fellowship where they can be nourished and discipled. Well, I'm not going to be real long this morning, but there are a few points I want to lift up from this particular passage. Now, Matthew 8 and 9 comes on the heel of Matthew 5 and 7. Matthew 5 and 7 is a sermon on the mount. It is the most lengthy dissertation recorded in the scripture where Jesus speaks, and he lays out an entire philosophy of ministry. He touches on almost every single area of life. He touches on spiritual life, on social life, on moral life, and he lays out principles that people should live by. So the question then becomes, you have theological insight, you have doctrinal dogma, you have a mastery of the biblical text, but do you have any power? Can you make things happen? Can you get things done? And the real test is, can we get things done in the name of Christ, not can we say the right things, quote all the scriptures, pray the best of prayers, sing the most most melodious song, but can we really get things done for the glory of God? And that was what the question mark was surrounding Jesus' ministry. So Matthew 5 and 7 is the tail part. Matthew 8 and 9 is the show part. So in Matthew 8 and 9, you have the most condensed, consolidated demonstration of the power of Jesus Christ in those two chapters. And he shows the power of that he has, the power over defilement as he healed the man with leprosy, the power over distance as he heals the man's uh, sick servant without even going to his house, the power over the disease as he touched and healed many people, the power over the elements when they were in the Lake of Galilee and a storm arose and he spoke to the wind and the sea and said, peace be quiet, the power over the demonic world as they go to where legion was, the man was demon-possessed, and Jesus takes authority over the demons. He's showing his power over the physical world, his power over the invisible world, that he, indeed the kingdom of God has come in power. And then in Matthew 9, verses 9 through 17, we see his power to pardon, his power to forgive, and that is the message that the world needs to hear. Many people are struggling in life because of guilt and because of shame. Because of guilt and because of shame. And guilt and shame and the stain of guilt and shame can only be removed as we know that we have been forgiven, that we have been pardoned, that God has indeed taken away our sins. And so in those verses, Jesus shows he has the power to forgive by coupling the message of forgiveness, thy sins be forgiven thee, and coupling that with a physical demonstration of power as he healed the man whose body was paralyzed. So this is about his power. This is about the power of Jesus Christ to make things happen. So we come to Matthew chapter 18. And Jesus has been speaking and he has been teaching. And while they're having this session, a man comes to him and said, Master, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And so Jesus arose and followed him and so did the disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and they touched the hem of his garment. And we know from Mark's account, the man's name was Jairus. And we know that he was a man of stature a man of influence. And so his daughter has died. He comes now to Christ and he asks the Lord to come and perform this incredible miracle. This passage teaches us a lot. But one of the things it teaches us, if we're not careful, we'll miss it, 
it shows us that Jesus, when he penetrates the world, he does not only penetrate the world of the up, the powerful, the high, and the mighty, but he also penetrates the world of everyday people, of common folk. And so in this text, Jesus allows himself to be interrupted. He's agreed to go to Jairus' house and to, and to deal with Jairus' dead daughter, but as this sacred processional is making its way through the thoroughfare of the street, there's an interruption. And he's interrupted by a woman, the Bible says. It does not give her name. She was just some woman. But she had a serious dilemma, and her dilemma was that she had a hemorrhage, an issue of blood, the text says. And it may have been a fibroid tumor. It may have been something that was a, was a result of, of a female organ problem that she had, but she had a serious problem because it was a, a hemorrhage for 12 long years. Now, again, in Mark's gospel, we get the rest of the story. The Bible tells us in Mark's gospel that Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. So simultaneously in two worlds, Jairus was enjoying all the position, the power, the influence that his position and his success awarded him, he had this beautiful little girl, he had known the joy of having a daughter, and simultaneously in the exact same place there was a woman that was suffering. And that's the way life is. Charles Dickens was right when he talked about a tale of two cities. A city of the best of times and a city of the worst of times. And when we are on mountaintop experiences and we are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and children being born and baptismal, when we're having mountaintop celebratory experiences at the same time, simultaneously, somebody is going through some serious suffering. Oh, y'all listen to me. But time has a way of just kind of walking us all down, you see. And if you live long enough, trouble will find you. Trouble will get you, disease will find you, death will find you, grief will grip you, loss will get you, betrayal will find you. You're going to deal with some pain down here if you stay down here long enough. So 12 years has passed, this woman has been ostracized, you've got to understand the Hebrew culture. That when a woman was going through her monthly cycle, she was considered to be unclean ceremonially. She could not go to the temple and worship. She could not go and offer a sacrifice during that period of time. As a matter of fact, after a woman gave birth, she had to go through a process of purification to once again make herself ceremonially unclean to be able to interact with the rest of the society. So if this woman had had a hemorrhage for 12 years, it means that she had been ceremonially unclean for 12 years. What does that mean? If she had a husband, he probably had abandoned her because he would be unclean and therefore he would be ostracized from the society. If she had children, they probably had forsaken her as well and left her all by herself to deal with the stigma of being a social outcast. But there's something about suffering, you see. It's no respect of person. And so when wealthy people's children die, they grieve just like us poor folk. Grief has a way of arresting us. Grief has a way of traumatizing us and holding us hostage in a moment in time where we have to deal with our humanity. And we realize that we are not immortal. We are finite beings. There are things in which we don't have control. And life and death are one of such things. And when people die, we are gripped, we are traumatized, we are held hostage, we are apprehended. And for a moment in time, we have to deal with God. And so this rich man, he has to deal with God now. And so he comes to Jesus for help. This, this poor woman with this ceremony uncleanliness, she also come to Christ, but she has to come incognito. Uh, she, she has to kind of slip in uh, through the crowd, maybe on her hands and knees, you see. And maybe people have stepped on her fingers. Maybe she's been kicked in the face. She can't come to him from the front. She cannot interrupt this sacred processional because if she does, then she's found out because she's not supposed to be in the crowd. But she finds her way to Jesus. And Luke's gospel says that she, she touched just a thread. That's all. She, she didn't, the, 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 Matthew says to him, she didn't touch the hem of his garment. That, that's an incorrect translation. The holy men like Jesus, they would wear a garb and a part of their outer wrap 
they would have tassels that would hang from the bottom of their garment. And that tassel was a reminder to them that they were a barrier of the word of God. And as they moved, the tassel would swing back and forth, and it signified they were carrying the word of God, and they were to dispense the word of God. So all this woman did, she just touched a thread, that's all, just a thread that was dangling from his garment. Now Luke's gospel said, Jesus said, somebody touched me. And Peter says, Lord, what type of question is that? People are pushing up against you, they're jockeying for position, and you have the audacity to say, who touched me? Jesus said, no, somebody has touched me because virtue has departed out of me. He penetrates worlds, y'all. He penetrates the low worlds of the lonely, of the discouraged, where the broken, the destitute of the society, and he makes himself available to the low lowlifes of the society. And all they have to do is reach up and touch just a hem of his garment. You know, some people come to church, and the, the, the choir doesn't sing right for them, and the, the, the deacons don't pray right, and the preacher don't preach right, and the ushers don't usher right, and the greeters don't greet right. Nobody did nothing right. And they say, I didn't feel God in that place. <laughs> the problem is, they just like the people in the crowd. They bumping into Jesus, almost ran over him, almost knocked him down, and didn't even know that Jesus was in the house. Because he was in the house in that greeter, in the house in that usher, in the house through the choir, in the house through the deacons, in the house through the minister of the word. He was trying to talk to you. He was trying to minister to you. But you were so preoccupied with your world that you missed the experience. You missed the experience. I tell people all the time, people can be mad about whatever they want to be mad about. There's one thing I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to enjoy going to church. I'm going to enjoy going to church. I'm going to enjoy seeing smiling people's faces. I'm going to enjoy shaking warm, winsome people's hands. I'm going to enjoy a choir who do the best they can every single week to minister us through music. I'm just going to enjoy the people of God as long as I can and as often as I can. And I'm going to enjoy the Lord's ministry through his people. Uh, give the Lord some praise. As the Father sent him, so sent he us. He's sending us into the world. He's sending us in the world to make ourselves available to people who otherwise could not get to Jesus. They are so broken in their spirit. They're so crushed in their confidence. They don't believe that God really cares. And so God is sending us into the world just as Jesus went into the world to make himself available for this lowly woman with this issue of blood so she could touch him. And in touching him, virtue was restored to her. And not only was she healed physically, but salvation came. He's sending us into the world. You know, I've never been more excited. You know, I just wish I was just a younger man. You know, I wish I was a younger man. I understand what, Bill, what Ben Tyler used to always tell me. Now, Brother Ben Tyler used to always tell me, I wish that I would have met you when I was a young man, you see. But I'm excited because the more difficult, the more stressful, the more complicated the society becomes, eventually people are, some people will be driven to look to God. And some people will be driven to the word of God. And some people will, will at least give an ear to what God's word has to say. So God is just setting the stage for the, for the church to have an opportunity once again to speak and to the issues of the day with a good word from God. What the Bible says as we sort of wrap this little homily up, that Jesus says to the woman in verse 22, and we saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour when she came into the ruler's house. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house, saw the flute players and the noisy crowd well. And, and he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. And when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand. And the girl rose. And the report of this went into all that land. And the Lord has not given me the power to raise nobody from the dead. And I don't have the power to heal anybody, but I know how to pray. That's what life has taught me for the last 32 years of walking with Jesus Christ. I have learned how to pray. And, and I have learned through my own personal suffering and pain that I've experienced in my own life 
the death of a mother and the death of a father and the death of an infant son and the death of aunts and uncles and people I love dearly, I have learned to have a little bit of compassion. I have learned to show some compassion. And I have experienced compassion being shown to me. So I know the power of compassion to bring healing to broken spirits, to troubled souls. And as we discharge that ministry, the power of God is being unleashed. So if people's spirit who is broken, people's heart that has been crushed, people's minds that have become disillusioned, if we're able to speak a good word or to perform some deed that causes them to, to not give up on God but to re-engage in society, that in itself is a great miracle. They become a better husband or a better wife. If they're able to father or mother their children, if they're able to take care of their aging parents, if they're able to be a stable, functioning member of society, that's a great miracle. And God's kingdom can be further advanced. Well, in these other miracles, you will see Jesus' power to open blinded eyes, his power to deal with demons, power over disease, it all culminates in Matthew 9. And i read this in a quick comment and I'm through. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. That's what it means to be a Christian. <laughs> what it means to be a Christian is when you leave the church when you leave the sacred confines of the sanctuary and you go back out into a world and you run into people and you run into women who have been domestically abused, you run into men and women that have been sexually abused as children and they don't know how to trust people and they, they're just messed up in their minds, and you run into children who are abused and neglected. And you run into people whose hearts have been broken because they've been abandoned by a spouse who they had pledged fidelity to and who did the same toward them. When you run into people whose lives have been ravaged by substance abuse, both of prescription drugs and non-prescription drugs, and you see the devastation, then you understand what it means to be a Christian. And then you understand what Jesus saw and how through his telepathic vision he could see things as they really were. And the Bible says when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. Some of the multitude had money. Some of them had chariots. Some of them had designer clothes. Some of them had jewelry dripping from every appendage. But they didn't have the hope that comes from knowing God. Are y'all listen to me? So there are people out there on the up and up. All you got to do is watch television as they parade these stars in front of us. Lives are in shambles. They got more money to do the more sadistic, perverted things. And they're in serious trouble. They're part of the group that Jesus saw. He was moved with compassion. He was torn on the inside because he looked at the people and they were like shepherdless sheep. They were vulnerable. They were easy prey for the enemy. So he says to the disciples, the harvest is plenty. You've got to understand, when Jesus used the word harvest, harvest has a twofold meaning. One part of the harvest is the harvest for salvation. The harvest for salvation. The harvest is plenty for salvation. But the other part of the harvest is the harvest always talks about judgment. That the world is moving toward a cataclysmic end that is ultimately moving toward judgment. And some people are going to be harvested into the kingdom of God, and others are going to be harvested for that great white throne judgment where people give account for their lives and be sentenced to punishment, commensurate with their sins and the rejection of Christ. So the harvest is plenty, as Jesus says. The laborers are few. The laborers are few. He didn't say the supervisors. <laughs> he didn't say the managers. He didn't say the sophisticated, powerful brokers, the CEOs, the COOs, the administrators. He says all we need is some laborers. That's all we need. All we need is laborers who know the Lord Jesus Christ, laborers who know how to share the gospel, laborers who know how to tell someone the plan of salvation, laborers who know how to pray for people to help them come to the kingdom of God. The laborers are few. Pray ye that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's my prayer, that God will raise up more laborers from in this, the Grace Bible Church.
And I've shared this with you before. I don't know what the future holds. I know what, what's in my heart today. And what's in my heart today is to give the next 15 years to this church and this community. If the Lord says the same. To love the people of this church and love the people from this community for the next 15 years and then see what the end looks like. See what God might do during that period of time. There's a lot of ache. There's a lot of hurt in this community. I, I, I can't deal with the whole Cornell Valley. It's too big, too much pain, too much hurt, too much ache, too large for me. My shoulder's not big enough to be like T.D. Jakes. I can't go all over the world. But I can't focus on the west side. And there's not enough pain, a lot of, enough hurt, enough brokenness, enough children that deserve a chance to not only know the Lord, but deserve a chance to pursue their dreams. They love the, the, to pursue their dreams. I'm, I'm just trying to pay a debt. Y'all don't I'm trying to pay a debt that I owe to my mama and my grandmama and my brothers and my sisters. I was their protege, my sister and I, and they poured everything in because they thought that we had a chance to do something. I'm just trying to pay that debt. To give it all back, to give it all back, everything's been poured into me to give it all back to a group of people. And I'm still looking for a group of young people, a group of young adults. But I can spend time with and tell them what I've learned. The mistakes, the successes, the pitfalls of dealing with people in powerful places, how to navigate the political system and not lose your integrity, your character, or your principle. How to speak truth to power and not flinch. That's what we need. We need people to rise up who really want to represent God and who want to represent God in every single theater, on every single front. I shared with you before, I spent a considerable time this year down at the legislature. Those people are insane. They're insane because they think they got all the sense. Ain't nobody else got none. And that's why they get so little done, because they only listen to each other. They only listen to each other. And they don't listen to people with real ideas that can bring about real change. And that's why we got to raise up Christian people who want to penetrate the political world. Not to try to bring the kingdom of God into politics, but to bring sanity and principle. Because we got to live with the policies that come out of Washington and that come out of Charleston State Capitol. The harvest is plentiful. The labors are few. Pray you to the Lord that he might send forth laborers into the harvest. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for the privilege of being a laborer to bring in the heart. Lord, though our numbers have dwindled over the years, we still believe you have a work for us. And we just want to do that work you ask for us to do. If we would please you today, Father, to maybe call someone that's here out of darkness into the light. Maybe there's a man, a woman, or a boy or a girl that's here today 